The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. And so he said to the Samaritan woman, God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. In fact, Philippians 3.3 3 says we worship by the Spirit of God. When so many were deserting him, Jesus said the Spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing, the words I have spoken to you are spirit, and they are life. Jesus never took it personally when somebody didn't believe in him. Uh, I think we had somebody ask a question here in the last two or three weeks. Uh, if it weren't, wasn't here with some place, somebody said something like this, that I get angry with a person who doesn't become a Christian. That's, I'm paraphrasing, but it was kind of like that. And don't do that. They can't help it. They cannot help it. You doesn't mean you shouldn't play with them, but don't get angry with them. Uh, all right. Now we're going to talk about his explicit introduction of the Holy Spirit. Jesus waited just before the end of his earthly ministry to introduce the Holy Spirit in a definite and explicit way. So, he spoon-fed the disciples as gently as possible because he knew they would not be thrilled at first. In fact, we're told they were filled with grief. I think there are people today teaching the Holy Spirit doesn't bless them. They don't like it. They, they want to talk about something else. And maybe you get upset when you hear work about, uh, uh, talks about the Holy Spirit. Well, uh, you're in pretty good company. As soon as Jesus talked about it, they didn't like it. Uh, his aim was to help them to make the adjustment from the level of nature to the level of the Spirit. What's that? Well, level of nature. That's seeing Jesus in the flesh, knowing the sound of his voice, having him with them at all times, his physical presence. You see, his voice had a certain sound. Uh, you that have heard me over two or three times, uh, if you weren't looking at me, you hear my voice, you say, that's RT. Uh, there are people you know. When they answer the phone, you know their voice. Well, Jesus had a voice. And they, they, they could be looking another way. But they didn't need the Holy Spirit to say, this is Jesus. And they just knew. They could tell you his color of eyes, his color of skin. Uh, they could tell you how tall he was. Uh, the, in other words, level of nature. The physical presence of Jesus. And now he's saying, I'm going to go away. I'm going to send you another and they didn't like it. Well, then what is the level of the Spirit? That is seeing Jesus in the Spirit and or by faith, getting to know his voice by the Spirit's impulse, having him with them at all times, but by the presence of the Holy Spirit. And so the opening line, he says, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another comforter, another counselor, He'll be with you forever. Now, that verse is loaded with information, none of which was welcome. And uh, as I said, they didn't want another. And uh, we often resist what God is saying at first. And we all must, in varying degrees from time to time, make the transition from what seems natural to what is higher and spiritual. Paul said to Corinthians 3.18, We with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, are being transformed into his likeness with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And so, as I've been saying, our first reaction is often negative. Uh, but having made the adjustment, we see it was for our good. My old mentor, Roth Barnard, used to say, that the first work of the Holy Spirit is to confuse. Uh, doesn't mean everybody uh, is going to be confused, but it is often that way. Uh, all right. This, this introductory statement says three things. First, 
that he will put a petition to the Father. And this is described in detail in John 17. We don't have time to go into that tonight, but that's where you get his high priestly prayer. He prayed for the 12 minus Judas Iscariot. Uh, his prayer was heard for he had just said before his ascension, I'm going to send you with my father's promise, but stay in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. That means the city of Jerusalem. Acts chapter 1 verse 4, he tells the disciples to wait for the gift that my father has promised. And when he took his place at the right hand of God, he fully carried out this promise. And Peter said in his sermon on the day of Pentecost, exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit and has poured out what you now see and hear. The Father would give another counselor, uh, both words are important, another meaning one like Jesus, but counselor uh, or helper, one who comes alongside. And Jesus had been that for three years. He had come along physically. Uh, as I said, they knew how tall he was. They knew the color of his eyes. Uh, they had him all to themselves. It was physical. It was a natural level. Uh, another paraclete would come from the Father, but invisible. He, however, would be as real to them as Jesus had been. And they couldn't figure that out. Uh, he would even take... He would even make Jesus as real at the spiritual level as he had been to them at the natural level. Uh, no way could they figure that out at the time. And later he put it to them like this. In a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. They had no idea what he meant and began discussing it. And he assured them that one day you're, you're not going to be sorry. He said it's like a woman giving birth to a child as pain. But after the, the, the child is born, uh, the grief is gone. And so now is your time of grief. And one day you will rejoice. And this is why Jesus quoted Psalm 16, verses 8 to 11, uh, in his sermon on the day of Pentecost. When he said, I saw the Lord always before me. It's my view. This is a view I hold that when David wrote Psalm 16, he saw Jesus. He saw his face. A thousand years in advance of him coming in the flesh. And so that on the day of Pentecost, Jesus was that real to the disciple. That real. It was as though they got him back. It was as though they got him back. And David said, I saw the Lord always before me, and Peter quoted that very verse. Um, here's a, a, a side note. It's nothing we want to go into detail about, but you might like to know this. An ancient controversy that helped divide Eastern Christianity from Western Christianity is at stake here. Um, most of us are from the Western Christianity. I've got a friend back there. He won't mind uh, my pointing him out. I'm going to give you his name. I don't want to make him rich and famous. But he... You, yes, you. You come from the Eastern, the Armenian, and the Orthodox. Now, I don't know whether you've thought much about this, but do you know what, what divided the Western Church from the Eastern? Uh, the Eastern, uh, the Western Church says that the Holy Spirit would come from the Father and the Son. The Eastern Church, your background, said he would come to, from the Father through the Son. And big deal. I'll tell you what it was then. We look at that and think, good land, why would they split? That's why you've got Eastern Orthodox today. That's the reason. They went wild over this. How dare you say, he comes from the Father and the Son. He comes from the Father through the Son. It's known as the Filioque controversy. All right, this counselor would be with us forever. The person of Jesus was on earth for over 33 years, and Hebrews calls it the days of his flesh. The counselor that would be coming would be with him forever. No fear of being deserted. He said, I won't leave you as orphans. I will come to you. 
and his coming was not physical but by the Holy Spirit. That means they got Jesus back again. And he was so real to them. He said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. He was that real. They would not bring him back from the right hand of God. And uh, there it is. I think we'll stop there for the moment.